this set B corresponds through F to some, th uh, to, to some X. Oh, well, wh what, what would we then look at? If B were F of X, then consider what's true about X. Consider X and consider X. Is X in B? No, why not? Yeah, if, if X were in B, then X would not be in F of X. But X not in F of X uh, would be a contra contradict the fact that X is in B, right? So is X in B? No, because uh, I if it were, because uh, then X would not be in F of X, but F of little x is B. So X in B implies X is not in B. Contradiction. Yes? Okay. So if X is in, is that we've just shown X can't be in B. If it's, if it's, uh, so, but if X is not in B, then what does that mean? But then, that means X is not in F of X, which equals B. But this is a definition of B. So then what? X is in B. Again, contradiction. Either way, we get a contradiction. So what, what must, what's the only alternative now? If either way we get a contradiction, that must be false, the fact that B is in the image of F. So uh, uh, B is not in the image of F, in F uh, equal F of X for any X in, in, in A. That's the end. Such a bijection could not have existed. That's the desired contradiction. OK? Drew, are you happy with that? Pretty nifty, right? Very, very good. Very good. This was uh, Cantor's uh, beautiful uh, diagonal argument, most general form. I just want you to know that th this, this concept that now we have many different sizes of infinity uh, met with a lot of resistance in the late 1800s. Okay? Um, uh, one mathematician called, uh, called it a plague that we would never rid ourselves of. I mean, it's, it, it was, uh, uh, and, and ultimately it you know, contributed, I don't know, some of you heard this story, it contributed to uh, Cantor, uh, Cantor going crazy. Okay? It, was not, it, was, it was hard for him to take the rejection of uh, his peers, many of whom did not uh, welcome these ideas when they were first presented. So uh, let's give an example of how you might think about these pow this power set. What's an example of a power set of R? So what we learn is there are many different sizes of infinity. There are many cardinalities, right? So for instance, what is a set with cardinality 2 to the R that has the same cardinality as the power set of the real numbers? Well, I claim you know one already. Another way to talk about subsets of a set, if this set is a set of real numbers, is to associate to every real number a what? A 0 or a 1, right? What is that? That's just a function from the real numbers into the set 0, 1. So notice that um, uh, 2 to the if you like, 2 to the a has the same cardinality as the set of all functions from a to the set 0, 1. So all functions. This is just by membership, by the membership relation. So if you want, 2 to the r has the same cardinality as the set of all functions from uh, R to 0, 1. 
there's a set that's that's automatically huger than than R. Okay. I mean, what does that look like? You know what functions like that look like, don't you? Here, here's a graph. Zero, one. These are basically functions that could be take can be sometimes zero and sometimes one for all real numbers. If I want to graph such a function, don't make me keep going, please. Yes, it might be one some of the time, you know, for a whole interval. Okay, interesting. Yes, Willie. Yes, yes. In fact, um, this is the, so the question Willie asks is, does this mean there are infinitely many uh, infinite uh, cardinalities? And the answer is yes. So consequence of this theorem is that there are uh, infinitely many. In fact, it is true uncountably many, but uh, it actually doesn't even make sense to say how, how many there are, but there are infinitely many. Um, uh, cardinalities. And they go something like this, right? The cardinal numbers go something like this. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. Uh, then at some point you have the first size that's not finite, and that's called uh, LF null. And then, of course, you can argue that that there is a first size or cardinality that is not LF null, and that's called LF1. And so on. There's one that's bigger than that. That's LF2, et cetera. Um, but beyond that, <laughs> you can go for a while, but um, uh, it actually turns out that these cardinalities are indexed by uh, the ordinal numbers. And I'm going to spend a fun lecture later on in the semester talking about ordinal numbers. But there are tons. And the continuum hypothesis, which I referred to last time, is basically the following fact. This cardinality is the cardinality of z, of the integers, yes? And the cardinality of the reals is often called the continuum, the cardinality of the continuum. But what uh, you might ask is, is the, what, which one of these is the cardinality of the continuum? So the cardinality of R is sometimes denoted by a little c. That's the continuum. But uh, you, know, you might ask yourself, where does it belong in this picture? And the continuum hypothesis says that uh, well, it's the, it's the, the claim is, uh, the hypothesis suggests that the cardinality is actually uh, LF1. That's the question. Uh, and what's known is that whether the answer to this is yes or no is actually not provable within the axioms that we have. So it's actually could be true, taken to be true or false and not change the other axioms of set theory. So the continuum hypothesis, you can read more about this if you want, which says that LF1 is the same as C, is what's called undecidable. It's provably undecidable, meaning independent of the axioms of set theory. Zermelo ZFC axioms is what they're known as. It's kind of a surprising fact that a, 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 a statement about the real numbers you would expect to either be true or false. But in fact, this is uh, undecidable, and there are models in which it's true and models in which it's false. Amazing. Other questions? Yes, Emil. Uh-huh. 